I think we've become what we've done. We become what we do. Sitting on a park bench and watching clouds go by, going fly fishing, knitting. These are the taken for granted everyday activities that nobody really considered worthy of scientific investigation. But every occupation has all of these layers of benefit and complexity. And so Betty Yerksa came up with this idea that we would have this new science occupational science. Betty could see that if we really wanted to understand humanity, we had to understand what they did every day, and we had to study it scientifically. In the 70s and 80s, the profession of occupational therapy was really going through intellectual crisis. There wasn't a consensus about what our foundational science ought to be. Unless one has a conceptual framework to operate from, things don't progress. We can't evaluate the effectiveness of what we do. And I became the chair at USC in 1976. At the time, we had these strong intellectual traditions, Mary Riley, Jean Ayers, Margaret Rood. But our program was in a very precarious situation. This was a department with five faculty and about 30 students, a tiny, tiny department. We were housed in old wooden barrack buildings, what were called temporary World War II barracks, but this was long after the war, so they, so they weren't temporary anymore. There was a lot of great thinking being percolated in that environment. It was just an exciting time with a lot of exciting people, very capable, very highly skilled, very opinionated, <laughs> and yet open to trying to build something together. People were absolutely true believers that there is a power of occupation and that this power was transformative. The world just needed to understand that. We had a series of faculty retreats that were held here in Aspendale. The ideas were flying, the arguments were very intense, and out of that we developed a conceptual frame of reference for the doctoral program and for the science from the biological level all the way on up to what we call the transcendental level. Our vision for occupational science as it began was that of providing a support for our field of occupational therapy. But Dr. Gelia Frank, the anthropologist, helped us remember that occupational science could have societal benefits in a much broader sense than just to our field or to health itself. I made it my business to keep inserting the idea that this was relevant not just to individuals but to groups and societies and cultures. It was clear that this discipline needed to be formed. I would say we started in 1983 and by 1989, we had our discipline. In the late 80s, we also began the period of the Occupational Science Symposia. The symposium was one of our first major ways of sharing our thinking with others who were interested. Occupational science was, by the early 1990s, being planted in other countries, in Australia, Scandinavia, South America. This was beginning to become an international science. There was a lot happening when I took my first class in occupational science. It had gone from a rich theoretical foundation when it started here and just deepened and broadened internationally. Since then, a number of other universities have initiated their own occupational science doctoral programs. I'd say occupational science is still evolving. The research and scholarship that's happening here is cutting edge in so many ways, providing us with new information around everything from basic neuroscience mechanisms all the way to how we think about social injustice. We're working here on ideas of knowledge mobilization so we can impact not only other disciplines, but probably more importantly, just the general public health. Taking diabetes as an example, we know that the kind of foods people eat, the kind of opportunities people have for physical activity really affect their likelihood of getting diabetes. I think appreciating the complexity of how people make those choices could actually move the needle on helping prevent diabetes. 
One thing I'm really excited about is that we have so many more people coming into the field. So the research diversifies, but it also gains depth. We have a great group of students, and seeing those students grow and progress is such a joy to me. They're going to go out into the world and actually continue to carry forward what we're doing here. I was born in 1989, so I'm as old as occupational science is. I'm looking forward to developing my own line of research and contributing to occupational science and the discussions that are going on within the field. It feels like a good academic discipline that I can make my home. Occupational science fits so well with my desire to help the individual as a person within their own environmental context, within their own narrative. There are a lot of difficult and complex social problems that occupational science is well-equipped to address because it brings together the human-focused perspective with strong evidence-based practices. Down on the ground, policies don't work in many ways. Occupational science may be able to sort of explore some of that messiness down on the ground and inform back why that policy initiative was not successful. That's what occupational science is about, human flourishing through engagement in everyday living. Dr. Yerkson, Dr. Clark, together with Dr. Zemke and other faculty and students here, had this amazing vision for developing this discipline of occupational science that is an amazing legacy to leave. I sometimes think what we did is say the name out loud, occupational science, as USC educators. We've never been afraid or limited in our thinking about the importance of occupation to the world at large. I'm very excited by what has happened and thrilled and humbled by what came out of those old wooden barrack buildings. I never dreamed that it would be what we see today. It's almost miraculous.